before the election, and now it's like taking new, new meaning for me. Um, pull this up. Right, so I was thrilled to be uh, invited to this workshop. Uh, I've been, for the past two years, working on a book on temporal discounting and how our assumptions about the passage of time affect our rational planning. My main area of philosophy is metaphysics, so for a long time I've been interested in the nature of the passage of time, objectively speaking, and just recently become a lot more interested in our assumptions about time and how those can affect our lives. So this topic uh, it was perfect for me and it gave me a chance to get a lot of evidence from other real world cases and other disciplines about how people are thinking about these issues. I want to introduce you to a couple of concepts and then I'll give you my really nihilistic argument and we can talk about whether it helps with any of Bastiat's problems. So I'm interested in time biases in my book and in my research right now. Two big time biases, uh, and this will be familiar, well, at least one of these will be really familiar to you guys, but the terminology might be a little bit alien. I'm interested in near bias. So near bias is our disposition to discount an event or experience that's scheduled further in our future um, because of its, of its temporal distance from the present. So the basic idea behind near bias, going back to Plato and the Protagoras, and certainly Bastiat, is, uh, is this idea that as things are scheduled further in the future, we might be taking the riskiness or probability of those events occurring into account when we decide we care less about them. But it might also be the case that as something is scheduled further in the future, it's just hard for us to see the value of that event. We find ourselves in a kind of optical illusion. This is how Plato describes it in the Protagoras. And that's when it becomes a bias. That's when it becomes near bias. So I'm interested in near bias. I'm also interested in a topic that philosophers, going back to <coughs> the Epicureans, have been fascinated with. But as far as I can tell, economists and social psychologists are much less interested in this is the question of how we discount experiences that have already occurred in our lives, or events that have already occurred in history, and how that might affect our original planning. So a big theme of the book is trying to convince people that there are problems in that neighborhood. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Instead, I'm interested in focusing on near bias, and I think most of the research on near bias has to do with our tendency to discount pains and pleasures, or things that will give us hedonic value. But there's a really interesting question about whether or not we also have these kinds of temporal biases when it comes to non-hedonic values. Now you might think, like, I don't even believe that there is any kind of value besides hedonic value. And if you're in that category, you can just, like, hum to yourself for the next 12 minutes because you're not going to be super interested in anything I have to say. But if you are, if you do think there might be a separate category of value that we can call meaningfulness or meaning assignments, then I think we can start to raise some interesting questions about whether or not our assumptions about the passage of time affect our ability to make those kinds of meaning assignments. And this might have really important implications for ways that we might try to give prudential arguments to people for caring about things that will happen after their deaths. For instance, climate change, the debt crisis, these kinds of remote effects that in the spirit of Bastiat we're trying to get better at seeing. So that's the question that I'm interested in in this chapter. Uh, already defined near bias, so uh, I said, I think to Marcus at lunch, I'd, I'd give you this slide from uh, the Singaporeans about trying to make yourself see the future more clearly. I spent sabbatical in Singapore two years ago, and they were running this massive campaign to try to convince you to care about your more distant future, and they had these ads uh, and actually trailers before all of the films where you're meeting your really distant future self and she's either really angry at you or really pleased with you because of things that you've done right now to set things up for her. So anyways, I threw that in because we were talking about it at lunch. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about near bias. Let's talk about what I mean by meaning. Because uh, this is a slippery concept in philosophy. I want to use it in a particular way to get this argument going. So a couple examples. Let's suppose, John, you're at the Tate Modern. You walk into the Rothko exhibit, I don't know if you're a modern art fan, but you look at the Rothko exhibit and for the first few minutes you're just like, I don't get it. I don't get why this is such an expensive painting, it looks like wallpaper. But then uh, Michael comes up to you and he says, no, I mean look, like Rothko committed suicide, he's at the end of like reinterpreting what it means to be an expressivist, it's part of this huge tradition that these other artists are now emulating gives you these facts. You learn more about the context of which you're looking at this art, and you think like, oh, this experience of looking at this art is really meaningful. Or maybe if you've had that conversation after looking at the art, you go back and assign more meaning to the experience of having looked at that art. That's the kind of value I'm talking about. And we're going to assume that it's not the case that you're getting more C fibers firing in your brain or more pleasure when you have that experience. There's some extra value that you're adding to it 
based on what you've learned about how it's connected up with facts outside of the experience. I get some other examples in the paper. Five assumptions I'm going to make about meaningfulness to try to get this argument off the ground. When we're making assignments of meaning like this, one, we're assigning some value to experiences or events in our lives that's distinct from the value that we get from pleasure. That's a, probably the most controversial assumption in this whole debate. Second, and this, if you read like the meaning of life literature, most philosophers are assuming that you can only assign meaning to an entire human life. Nozick makes this point really forcefully. Some social psychologists are also in this vein. I deny that assumption. I think we can assign meaning to individual events in our lives of any duration, or at least very flexible duration. So we can say, the experience of looking at this art on Tuesday at 2 p.m. was meaningful. The experience of waiting in line for the metro, not meaningful. Uh, we, can, we can do these assignments in atomistic events. Third, I think this is a self-interested thing that we're doing. Pursuing meaning is the kind of thing that can be in your self-interest. It's, a, it's a, in the domain of prudential rationality, or at least this, this version of meaning is the kind of thing that we can theorize about in the domain of prudential rationality. Four, it's commensurable with pleasure. So you might decide, uh, like, am I going to go to the Philip Glass Opera tonight? It's going to give me a splitting headache, so it's going to cause me some pain, disutility, by going. But it also might be super meaningful. So is the amount of meaning I get from this better worth the amount of pain that listening to this opera would cause me? I can undergo that kind of reasoning and do it in a better or worse way. The theory of rationality can actually tell me how to undergo those kinds of trade-offs. Finally, and this is where we get into the specter of nihilism, these meaning assignments almost always depend on extrinsic facts of a certain kind. So it's not the case, I suppose, though we could argue about this, that anybody finds himself in front of a Rothko painting thinking like, this is incredibly meaningful, but not being able to cite any fact that's giving it meaning, and not knowing anything at all about the context in which they're viewing that painting. Meaning is the kind of thing that always depends on other facts. So, once we get this fifth assumption on the table, then we can start asking questions about whether we're time biased about meaning. Because what kinds of extrinsic facts are going to help determine the value, uh, uh, the meaning assignments that we're, able to, that we're able to perform? And here's where we get into, I think, real debates about how we might use a theory of meaning to try to motivate people uh, for issues like climate change or debt, remote effects that happen outside of the confines of their own life. You might be able to think, if we take meaningfulness seriously, and we agree with the five assumptions Sullivan just put up, then Paul and I could get in the following exchange. Paul says, why should I care about climate change? None of these effects are going to be realized in the context of my life. I could try to give him a moral argument, but as we found, those have not been particularly motivationally effective. So we haven't stumbled on a moral argument that convinces people to take these issues really seriously. I might instead say, like, Paul. You think these activities you're performing in your life are meaningful right now? Writing philosophy, looking at art, listening to Philip Glass, op Glass operas. But if there's no future for art or opera or philosophy, no near future for that because, of cli because climate change presumably is going like, to degrade our economy to such a point where nobody pursues these cultural practices anymore, all of these things that you're investing in right now in your life are actually meaningless. That's bad for you. You're losing value in your life. Your ability to rationally assign value to experiences right now is threatened by the, by the remote consequences. So you say, like, okay, that, maybe this is a promising avenue for arguing why people, it's, it might be people's self-interest to care about events that are going to happen even after their deaths. And in fact, Samuel Scheffler gives arguments like this in the really badly titled Death and the Afterlife. Have any of you guys read this book? It came out two years ago. It's neither about death nor about afterlives. Instead, it's about how our assumptions about what's going to happen in human history after our deaths affect our ability to find value, self-interested value in our lives right now. He gives these thought experiments. Uh, this is, I think I got this from Paul. Stephen Hawking says we've only got a thousand years left. <laughs> Shuffling is these thought experiments. If you imagine the asteroid's going to hit the Earth and destroy everything 30 days after your death. If you knew that, would that affect your ability, would, how would that affect your motivation to pursue certain kinds of activities now? Would you want to have children? Would you want to do philosophy? You might think, you might not want to pursue certain kinds of projects that could only be completed a long time after your death. So like cancer research might seem pretty stupid to you if you thought you were in a doomsday scenario. But Scheffler goes even further and says it's not just for these like instrumental reasons that doomsday scenarios harm our ability to find meaning in our lives. It's also, uh, it's also because 
even though none of us thinks, maybe, I don't know, I can't speak for you guys, when I write a philosophy paper, I don't think it's going to have the same kind of impact on the world as somebody who discovers a cure for cancer. I don't participate in these activities or find them meaningful because I think they're going to have this really obvious big instrumental effect in the future. I just think I'm like participating in a tradition that's going to keep going on after my death. Scheffler makes a big deal about this in his book. In the paper, I raise some questions for Scheffler's approach. So Scheffler thinks the kinds of facts that are relevant to your ability to find meaning in your life are nearby future facts. It's your connection with nearby future generations that does the most important work for your ability to assign meaning to activities in your life right now. In the paper, I raise some counterexamples. I don't think that we're time biased in that way about meaning. I don't think it's a psychologically realistic posit. Though, again, this is something that our colleagues in psychology could probably study. With. It's the kind of thing we don't have to guess at as philosophers. We could probably do some empirical work to get a handle on. But I have my doubts about whether he has good arguments for saying that, uh, that the kinds of extrinsic facts that affect our ability to find meaning are only the nearby future ones. I also think that going down this road of trying to give people these prudential arguments about why they should do certain things or care about certain future, things in the distant future now using a meaning framework rather than a hedonic framework opens up this threat of new versions of nihilism. So I talk about that quite a bit in the paper. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But that's the basic gist. How much time do I have got? You have four minutes. Four minutes. Let's see. So let's do one thought experiment, one anti scheffler thought experiment. We're raising this question about whether our ability to find meaning in our lives is really time biased. Scheffler says yes. Why does he say this? Well, he says, look, if you find out you're in the asteroid situation, you're going to freak out. You're going to have a lot of difficulty assigning meaning to events in your life. But then you pause and you realize we're all in the asteroid situation. It's not going to happen 30 days after your death, but guess what? This is not going on forever. It might be catastrophic environmental degradation. It might be the heat death of the universe. It might be Jesus coming back on a comet. Something's going to happen where all of these human activities that we're so invested in are going to cease to be part of time and space anymore. And then there will be no future for any of it. I have pretty high confidence in that. So if we are in the doomsday situation, then why aren't we freaking out? Why are we still having philosophy conferences? Why aren't we just committing ourselves to the pursuit of hedonic value? Scheffler assumes it's because we have this form of time bias. Well, I think that that's a, that assumption is too quick. Well, let's take an activity, like the activity of doing philosophy, and ask, do you only care about your philosophical connections with nearby future generations? Suppose you found out you're in the following scenario. Right now, we're really interested in political philosophy, but it turns out right after our deaths, political philosophy is going to go into a hiatus. Nobody is going to do political philosophy for a thousand years. It won't be studied at universities. People won't be writing books about it. Nobody's going to be reading your work for a thousand years. There'll be a big hiatus, and then it's going to make a huge comeback, and people are going to rediscover these lost texts of 21st century political philosophy, and they'll become quite interested in ideas that we were really interested in, and it'll flourish again. If you discovered that, would that deprive you of the ability to assign meaning to any of your philosophical activities now? If Scheffler's right that we're really time-biased in this way about our ability to assign meaning to activities like doing philosophy, then you should say, yeah, the hiatus is like doomsday for me when it comes to doing philosophy. But I don't think a lot of us have that reaction. I don't think a lot of us think like Aristotle, if he had his druthers, should have realized that his work was completely meaningless because it was going to be a huge hiatus. I mean, depending on what you think about the, like when the Islamic Renaissance and Greek philosophy started. But there, there are these gaps in the history of interest in philosophical ideas. That doesn't mean that if you find yourself at the, at the beginning of a gap period, your work is meaningless because there aren't nearby future generations that you're connected with. That's the kind of strategy of arguing against Scheffler. I use in the paper. Uh, that's probably a ton of controversial things that we can talk about during Q&A, so I'm going to leave it there and give it to Joe Cool. Uh, and that brings us to, well, let's clap. <laughs>